So that's really the first part of what we were trying to accomplish in this second half of the chapter. Right? We wanted to understand why portfolio formation doesn't break the fundamental rule of finance. And it's because we weren't thinking about risk in the right way. And once we recharacterized risk from total risk to just systematic risk, we now have a measure of risk that is truly responsive to return. And so now that we have, uh, and now we can use, hopefully use the fundamental rule of finance to come up with uh, and help us solve our second problem, which is that calculating expected return mathematically um, as we did in the first part of the chapter is unrealistic in practice because we just don't know all those things about the future. So what we want to be able to do is use what we now know about risk and return to help us figure out a more practical way to calculate the expected return for an asset uh, given that we don't know the future. Okay? And that's what we're going to do here. And I'm going to try and walk you through the logic um, of, of how this was developed and how we think about it. Okay? And so we want to be able to estimate the expected return for any asset. And so what we need to do then is think about how expected returns are calculated. And we know, based on the fundamental rule of finance, that they are completely dependent on the risk faced by the investment. And now we know, of course, that it's only on the systematic risk that the asset has. Okay? And so if we want to think about how this relationship might work, we can start with the extremes. And again, this is always a useful tool when you're trying to do a thought experiment. Right? Think about the extreme cases and then think about how that might change when you're not in the extreme cases. So the most extreme cases and the way we start in this process is we say, if there exists an asset that has zero risk, then by definition, that asset must have zero return because risk and return trade off with the slight caveat that we understand that even if there's zero risk, there is, uh, we expect to make, we may expect some return because of the time value of money, right? Even though I know I can't lose my money by loaning, uh, by giving a loan to the US government, I do expect them to provide me something for not having access to my money while the US government is using the loan, right? So we expect that there is some minimum required return for a risk-free asset. It doesn't have to do with the risk, it just has to do with the time value of money. But given that the um, risk and return trade off one for one, what that implies is that any other asset that has non-zero risk, right, and all other assets have non-zero risk, uh, then we have to be able to estimate their expected return by adding some premium for the risk that we bear. And that premium, that risk premium, will be completely dependent on the level of risk that those assets have. Right? So a company like Google with a really high exposure to systematic risk should have a higher risk premium and thus should have a higher expected return than a company like uh, Coca-Cola, which has a lower exposure to systematic risk, a lower beta, and, and so should have a smaller risk premium. Right? And what that means is, if I can find a relationship that defines the risk premium, then I can calculate the risk premium for any asset, then I can use that risk premium, that relationship, add it to the risk-free rate, and I can get the expected return on any asset. And that's what I'm after. I'm after a way to estimate the risk premium so that I can use that to calculate the, risk, the, the expected return on my asset. Okay. Now, the risk-free asset, the only thing that we consider to be the risk-free asset in the U.S. market is a U.S. Treasury bond. Right? So U.S. government, uh, us making the U.S. government a loan. What we need though, um, so that part's easy. We, we don't need to figure that part out. What we do need to do is figure out a way to estimate the relationship between risk and the risk premium that I should add for that risk. How much extra return do investors demand for bearing extra risk? If I can quantify that relationship, then I can calculate the expected return for any asset. Right? And so when I'm thinking about quantifying a relationship, uh, I want to understand, uh, maybe start with the easiest kind of relationship. And that is 
what's called a linear relationship or a line. This is the simplest kind of relationship. It says that there's only two things that work here. Right? One is risk and one is return. So you can see in the x-axis of this graph is beta. On the y-axis is expected return. And I know one thing about this relationship that has to be true. And that is that the higher my beta, the greater my risk, the greater my expected return must be. So I know for sure, without doing anything else, I know that this has to be an upward sloping line. So the relationship needs to be positive and increasing because it has to be the case that when I have higher betas, I also have simultaneously higher returns. Right? So I know what direction my line should, look, uh, should go, but what I don't know is exactly how that line should be drawn, what the true relationship of the line is. But the nice part about a line is that I only need to know two points, two true points, and I can draw a line between any two points. So if I can pick two assets and know their betas and expected returns for sure, then I can draw a line between those two points and I can use that relationship of that line then to extrapolate and figure out the risk and return of other assets that I don't know for sure. Right? So we could imagine that I say, I know two things. One thing I always know is I always know that the risk-free rate has a zero beta. By definition, it's risk-free, it has no beta because beta is a measure of risk. So I know for sure that the risk-free rate will be my y-intercept. And because I also know that the only asset that's risk-free is a US Treasury bond, I can go and look at the yield to maturity on a US Treasury bond on the US Treasury website and I can calculate, or I don't have to calculate anything. I can just look, they report it, they list it every day. Uh, and I can go look at the expected return for a US Treasury bond. And that means I know for sure, I know one point. I know the X and Y coordinate for the, for the risk-free rate. Because the X is zero, it has zero risk by definition, it's risk-free. And the Y is the yield to maturity. So here I've graphed it at say 7%, it's not usually that high. In fact, right now it's at like 1%. Um, but I know one point for sure. And that means if I can figure out the points for one other asset, the expected return for some asset A and the beta for some asset A, then I can draw a line between those two points and boom, I have my relationship between risk and return. So let's assume that I, I, I have this magical asset A and I, I know that I estimate a beta of 1.6 and uh, uh, an expected return of 20% and I know those two things are true. Then I draw my line between the risk-free rate and the asset A point, and now I have the relationship between risk and return. This should help me extrapolate. In other words, this should help me understand the relationship for any other asset. But how do I take this line and turn it into a, uh, quantify this into a relationship that I can use? And the answer is, what I need is the slope of the line. I need the formula for the line, okay? So remember that the formula for a line is the rise over the run. And where the rise is on the y-axis and the run is on the x-axis. So the slope is the difference between point 0.2 on the line and point 0.1. Right? So that's the difference between the expected return for A and the risk-free rate. Right? That's y2 minus y1. That's the rise. And then the run is the difference between the beta for A and the beta for the risk-free rate, the run. Good. Now, I can plug all that in and calculate the slope. So the expected return for asset A had a 20% return. The expected return of the risk-free rate was 8% divided by the beta of 1.6 for asset A minus the beta of the risk-free rate, which is always zero. And that gives me a slope or what we call a reward to risk ratio of 7.5. Now this ratio is also maybe more commonly called the sharp ratio but because the book calls it the reward to risk ratio I, I leave it like that here but uh, you will probably hear it more in practice uh, if you ever do hear it called the sharp ratio. After the guy that developed this whole uh, logic. So what it means, and, and the way we understand it going forward, is that this is the slope of the line should define the relationship for any other uh, asset. 
And remember what the slope means. It means for a change of one in X, what change in Y should we expect? And so what this says is if the beta goes from zero to one, we should expect the expected return to go up by 7.5%. Right? And that's how we understand this line, right? Uh, so uh, the expected return is 8% at zero. By the time it gets to one, it should be eight plus 7.5, which is 15.5. Uh, and that's where the line is. And if it goes up, if the beta goes up by one again to two, we should expect the expected return to go up by an, another 7.5%. Right? So this is how we use this re relationship. This is how we use the Sharpe ratio. We want to understand if a stock or an asset has more risk, how much more return should it be? And so if this line is truly drawn, because I know the two points for sure, then the relationship is true. And that's how I'm going to use it to calculate the expected return for more and different kinds of assets.